<laughs> Hi there. We're already we're already in deep conversation. Look at us. Hi everybody. Welcome to Engineering for Good, a new live program that's focused on a fun and insightful exploration of all things related to engineering and design. I'm your host, Dr. Daryl Williams, Senior Vice President here at the Franklin Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this new program. This is the first episode, so please be gentle, um, but in all seriousness, very excited to, to welcome you to this program. Um, so as a formally trained engineer myself, I'm familiar with engineering and design in many aspects, but to be, you know, admittedly, um, I don't know everything. And so I'm really excited um, because the topics of engineering and design are so broad. I'm really excited to, to learn more. So. Um, thank you for joining me on this journey. Um, and, and actually, let's peel back the onion uh, here and uncover some of both the challenges and opportunities with living in a designed world. So just a couple of housekeeping rules before we jump in. One is let's have fun. Uh, this again is conversational and we want you to be involved. So please uh, feel free to use the chat feature on Zoom and myself and guests will do our best to answer your questions. So let's just jump in and get started. So today we're going to have a conversation about artificial intelligence and human technology, the human technology interface. So artificial intelligence or AI as it's known has a long research and development history that began many, many decades ago. Um, and as the technology advances, so does its ubiquity. AI enhances our abilities to sense, our abilities to collect data, and also to create targeted personal solutions that improve our human experiences. And so I am super honored. Again, this is the first episode of this particular live program. So I'm deeply honored that I was able to land a true all-star guest to help us unpack what this all means. So please help me welcome Dr. Ayana Howard. She is the Linda J. and Mark C. Smith Professor and Chair of the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech, a recipient of numerous awards, both nationally and internationally. She's world renowned for her work in the technology areas of artificial intelligence, computer vision, and robotics. She also founded a university spinoff called Xy Robotics and serves as its Chief Technology Officer. Welcome, Dr. Howard. Thank you. Normally we say, and the crowd roars, but <laughs> the format, so. <laughs> yeah, well, here we are in this, in this digital space. So again, uh, it's such a pleasure to have you here. Um, you, this is just, you know, you, you live and breathe a, a lot of this work and, and you've made such a tremendous impact to date. So really excited to dive in and, and get into some really good discussion here. I do want to try something here, though, just to kind of break the ice. So I have what I'm gonna call the quick seven. So these are just seven questions that are really fun for you to just try to, you know, as quickly and quickly is, is relative, but um, just a quick way to sort of, you know, get to know you. So I understand that when you were growing up, you were fascinated with superheroes. Yes, and yes, so I was. who was your favorite and why? So the bionic woman um, and why? Because she was real, right? She was like a real human like not born out of, you know, the, the, the depths of X, but she also was like amazing because she was robotic, right? And so that was the thing. I, I liked the fact that she was human and was trying to save the world, but she was also, you know, had some technology in her, just fascinating. That is very fascinating. So, okay, so, okay, so that was you then. So now if you could create a superhero today, what attributes and characteristics would it have? Okay, so if I was to create a superhero today, it would actually be the Iron Man. Okay, so <laughs> I would say, but it would be the Iron Woman, right? Like we need okay, an Iron okay. Woman. Um, again, I think it's because it's the evolution, right? It's still a person. And, and I really think that robotics and humans, we, it's just a tightly integrated thing. But, you know, it's an augmentation of who we are as people, but we can still save the world. And so it hasn't really changed, even though it's been... I won't tell you how many years it's been since like back then. <laughs> okay, this is good, this is good. Okay, so now my next question is sort of, you know, again, I'm highlighting your just phenomenal work. So how did it feel 
to be named one of the top US women in tech by Forbes and then most powerful, one of the most powerful women engineers in the world by Business Insider. Um, so I will tell you that in one aspect, you're, you're kind of like, oh, is this a spoof, right? Like my friends, they're, they're just coming. But I think it's because you're proud. And the reason why is because the kind of engineering I do is about social good. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's not about, say, just working for a company and, and making, you know, billions sometimes, but it's about using engineering and the mind to improve our lives. Um, and so I was truly honored that that was thought of as valuable in, in society. Right. OK. And then that, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it speaks to the work that you're doing. Um, exactly. So if you weren't a roboticist, what would you be? Um, so honestly, I would be a CSI investigator. Really? Um, okay, say I more would. about that. So one of the things, I, I, I'm a puzzle. I like puzzles. I like mm -hmm. figuring out and, and, and trying to solve things. I think that's what robotics is. But if I think about, you know, the science fiction and, and like the, what's the real life mysteries, it is, you know, going into a place and you have clues, but you have no idea and you have to figure out the puzzles to put it together to solve a mystery. Um, so it's, it's the real life, you know, Nancy Drew kind of stories. Very good, okay. And what's your favorite sci-fi movie? The Matrix. The um, Matrix, oh, okay. And, okay. So I will tell you why. And, and number one, you know, not like, I saw all of them, by the way, um, because it was this, it was, so think about it, it's so fascinating. So the robotics AI agents needed people, right? They needed mm. us. Um, and yet they, they, they were still, they just, they didn't value us in terms of being, you know, a social creature, but they depended on us and we depended on them. And it was this symbiotic relationship that I think really, uh, you know, kind of, I felt um, in, in terms of this aspect. And, and then there was the, the positives were, like they improved our life, even though they enslaved us, right? It was about improving, you know, our lives. And, and that was one of the reasons it's like, yeah, we made the perfect world and humans didn't like it. And so we had to make it a little bit crappy and, and humans thrive. And it was like, they, they understood us, right? Because sometimes we just like crappiness around us, but they understood us and they adapted to us. Um, so it's one of my favorite, plus, you know, the special effects. Right, right. I mean, for it's, that was a, a remarkable movie, right? I think the other thing too that's interesting about that movie is this idea um, and focus on intelligence, which I think is a really interesting sort of thread between some of what we'll get into today, like machine learning and then, but then once they develop and enhance their intelligence, then at what point this idea of usefulness and utility do, because you said, you know, the symbiotic nature and matrix of the human and the technology together, but then at what point do we become useless yeah that's the and and the other thing about the the use usefulness or useless the one thing that the scene that i remember the most that really resonates with me is when neo had to make a choice i, I was going to say choice yes <laughs> and 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 in and, and all of my in all of mm. my research in my philosophy i think whenever we're using ai whenever we're using robotics we still have to give people that choice, right? Like at the end of the day, we have to do that. Um, and, and so if I, if you were going to ask me what you didn't, but I'll tell you, what is your favorite scene in the matrix? It's, it's that one where he had to yep. make a choice. Um, and it was so funny well. that you say that because as you said that I was literally thinking about the red pill and the blue pill and the moment of choice as you, when you said them, when you mentioned that movie and that to me was, I think the, probably the hallmark of the whole feature was that you have to make a choice, right? Yes, yeah. That's interesting. So when did you discover that you love science? Um, actually, I would say I realized it in middle school. Um, mm -hmm. So age of, you know, 11 to 13. And it was because I was fascinated with science fiction and science fantasy. So I looked at anything that had, you know, robots, space or superheroes, I, I was hooked. Um, and I, I think it was at the time, 
it was just fascinating and amazing that there were these roles and these technologies and these aspects. And I wanted to find out how it worked. Um, and so science and engineering allowed me to figure out when they talked about, you know, warp travel. It's like, okay, does that really exist? I don't know. And looking like, yeah, no, but right. Like these are the components of why they think that's true. Um, right. And so it was really that world that, that started me interested. Great. Interesting. So my last quick seven is, would you describe yourself as an inventor or an innovator? An innovator. Um, I, I think of, and I will kind of define my definition and, and it's, it's probably wrong and, and butchered, but it's just the way, the reason I think of myself as an innovator versus um, an inventor. So an innovator is one that I, I believe creates solutions for, for real problems. Um, and so they may invent as an innovator, whereas an invention is, you know, I created, you know, a new gadget. Nobody's going to use it. Nobody's going to pay me for it, but I created it. So I'm an inventor. Whereas an innovator would be, I created that gadget in order to, you know, cure cancer. That's mm. an innovator. So that's really interesting too, because I remember I was, um, applying for an assistant professorship and I was having, I was, you know, presenting my thesis, if you will, for how I would orient my, my research. And I was going to, I had this conversation with the selection committee and with the grad students that were in the audience about the difference between invention and, and innovation. And I said that exact thing that we can invent something and it may or may not have utility. But the invent innovation is when that you it's there's clear utility and that utility has the ability to um, live up to some level or certain level of ubiquity. I agree. Right. So, and I push back because I think those two words are so conflated. We throw the word innovation out a lot without really unpacking what innovation means, and I think we don't use the term invention enough because. I don't know if it's because from a cultural perspective, the idea of innovation sounds sexier. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's because, um, so I, I think that, and you had said, I have to choose. Um, deep down, I'm both because I invent as a outcome of my being an innovator. But you can innovate around, you know, social justice, right? It's not like you're, you might not be inventing something but you might innovate because you know how to bring people together that may not have communicated before, right? That's being innovative, but you're not inventing a new process. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think uh, a lot of people put invention tightly with engineering, but I believe that that's totally wrong. I, I, I think that you can think about, you know, social causes and invent something new that it, it may not be, you know, a new iPhone or, or a new Samsung device, but you're inventing a process. You're inventing ways for people to communicate. You're inventing X. And it's not just engineer, although I would say, you know, the engineering thinking process. Yeah, yeah. No, that's interesting. I think, yeah, I think the invention can be a, a widget or gadget or whatever. It can be a process. I think yeah, exactly as you, as you just said, right? But then it's like that next level, if you were to scaffold it, right? To go, going from the idea and recognizing that there's a problem that needs to be solved and you come up with an idea to solve that problem. And then, that, then thinking about the steps to then make it something that has broad utility is that continuum continuum of invention innovation right and they kind of and they they reinforce each other they do and if you had been if i had been on your committee i would have passed i would have said <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yeah right too funny too funny all right well no thank you for for you know for 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 being a uh, game for that little that little quick icebreaker so let's actually jump in and, and get into some of the nitty-gritty with respect to your work so you focus on robotics you do a lot of work in artificial intelligence and so artificial intelligence is, is in many ways revolutionizing the way we do almost everything so in what ways, and I've heard, you know, I've read some of your work, I've heard some interviews that you've done in this whole conversation about bias and bias in technology. So how does bias come into play into technology and how technology develops? And then, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start there and then I'll, I'll ask my, my next question. 
Yeah, so I, I think that, that bias in general, and in, in AI, I'll define what bias is, but I think bias um, in AI is, is a threat. It's more so than, you know, robots taking over all of our jobs and destroying us. Bias is the real threat. Um, and, and what is it? So when we design, you know, artificial intelligence and robotics, it learns from data. And that data is from people, it's from humans, right? And so what that means when an, an AI is making a decision, maybe it's about, you know, medical diagnosis, maybe it's deciding who should get, uh, who should be put in the ICU unit, right? Like maybe it's something fundamental like that. Well, it's based on how we made decisions in the past. And the fact is, is we are all biased, all of us. And it doesn't matter, you know, where you live, you know, how you were raised, we are all biased. And if that bias comes into our AI system, it augments it because it makes it truth. Uh, and, and that's a problem. And it means that we're now seeing disparities when AI comes in. Positive in terms of, you know, there's positive outcomes overall, but there's differences in how different groups are being treated when, when AI comes in. And, and that is a threat. And so how then do, recognizing that that is the threat, how do, where, where do we, where do we um, mitigate? Where does the mitigation come into play? Yeah, so I, I think that there's kind of three uh, solutions to this. So one is the developer side. And so I'm a developer is like, how do you design ways to think through making sure your algorithms aren't as biased? But I think there's a, society has a role in this, right? Mm. Like people, they over trust these systems. I mean, just as an example, how many of, of, of individuals when they get their, their Siri or their Alexa change the voice. What do you do? Mm. You choose the default voice, right? Which typically in the US happens to be female. But why, why are you allowing someone else to choose for you, right? And, and so that's data, right? So then people can say, oh, but people like female voices for their systems. No, because people didn't change. And so mm. I think we, as people, we need to start pushing back and, and looking and digging a little bit deeper into the tools that we have so that we can change the kind of data that we are feeding back into these systems. And so developers, it's our fault, but it's also people's fault for just basically accepting. So, uh, so how do, how do we, how do we um, sort of um, maintain that sense of agency as as users because i think the way technology is developed in many ways it's developed with the idea of improving our experience but it doesn't often rely on us through the throughout the development process so where where's the the information exchange and the opportunities for users to really play a role in helping change how yeah. ISCs are either um, eliminated or reduced. Yeah, so um, people think that because AI, you know, is this, you know, magical creature that there's, there's no impact that society has to change. But I'm going to give you an example of going green, right? Like, think about this whole concept of green and energy conversation. And in fact, if you look at the news, like every other day, some companies like, we are vowing to, you know, reduce our emissions and carbon footprint, right? Like, do you think the companies just decided one day to wake up and do this? No, mm. it actually costs money. It, it came from people voicing their opinion. It came from them writing to, you know, posts and, and blogs in the newspapers. It came from putting together groups and writing letters to CEOs. We have a lot more power. AI is no different. It's not, even though we are kind of almost, you know, relying on it now, it, it doesn't mean that we can't say, hey, I want to go equivalent to going green. I want AI to be unbiased. I want AI to be ethical. I want AI to work for everyone, irrespective of you know race, gender, age, disability, ability. And I'm wondering too, as you're talking about this, I'm wondering, is it just because people too don't really have a full grasp of what this all means? And from a science communication perspective, the way that the, how this is being communicated to the general public Again, it's about people's knowledge and understanding, but then also feeling empowered, if you will, to like voice and, and ask for, for, for more involvement and change. I just, is, is, it, is it because people lack just a full grasp of? I, I think people don't understand how pervasive AI is. 
right? Yeah. And so, and and the other thing is, is when you talk, when you see about see things about bias, you know, whether it's written in books uh, or if it's on the news, it always seems to be about someone else, right? Like, oh, it's biased against this group, and you go like, yeah, but that's not me, right? Or it's biased against, you know, women in you know sub-Saharan Africa, and you're like, oh, well, that's not about me. But the fact is, every day we are using at least one system and, and by count it's probably closer to three to five systems. Every day that's collecting your data and using it. Um, in fact, as you might well know, if you're using an interface such as teleconferencing, whatever it is, the flavor of the day, guess what that data is being used for, right? Have you ever noticed when you go in how like there's this checkerboard of, of people being, like someone comes in and it's like a checkerboard of things, well, there is some science, like, what are you focusing mm. on? Like, who gets the center pixel? Who gets that center thing? Because that's, you know, that's the power position. Like, what, what you think that is just random? Like, someone's programming this intelligence based on the data and based on where people are looking. Um, and so we are using these systems every day that are collecting everyday people's information. Um, and what happens is then it changes our behaviors. And so just like in the matrix, right, it influences what we then do and how we act, uh, which means that we start to lose a little bit of our humanity if, if we're not careful. So I'm saying we just need to be careful at this point. Well, and you bring up another interesting point. So there's a new documentary out that's on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Yes. But it really sort of, uh, you know, unpacks a little bit of, of how this is all working. And um, to be honest with you, it was, it was rather, rather <laughs> I, it was a lot to, to, to watch and, and to try to, to understand and decipher, but they were talking about how now we and our data have become the new commodity and that companies rel are, rel are becoming more reliant on our data because it's worth trillions of dollars to be able to change our behavior and to be able to understand and, 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 all, and you know, all of those kinds of things. So. It did, I think part of it too, as we're talking about sort of agency and people feeling comfortable um, being part of, of voicing concern and, 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 and requesting a little bit more transparency, I think there's also probably this element of fear too, right? I would think this, this you know, knowing that my cell phone is listening to me um, and when I pull up an Instagram and I'm having a conversation with somebody about Starbucks and then the next thing I get a Starbucks ad, uh, you know, pop up <laughs> on yes, exactly. Instagram. It's like a little, it's a little overwhelming. Yeah, so, and the fear, I, I believe the fear comes from not just the uncertainty, but not knowing what's going on, right? And, and so one of the things that we know knowledge helps with fear when you have knowledge about the inner workings about how an algorithm works and and not like we're not talking about here's the math behind it but like how it really works and what is it doing when it's collecting data and how is it using not only your instagram but your facebook and your youtube and your linkedin your email to basically create a doppelganger of you like if you understand that um, we find that that actually removes some of the fear because mm. now you understand what's going on. And now you know, okay, now that I understand what's going on, what can I do, right? That's the next thing, but you have to understand it. And, and I think it's, it's as a developer, sometimes we complicate this, as an engineer, sometimes we complicate this because you know you wanna be like, yeah, I'm smart, we have egos. But I, I think that these things are fundamental to who we are as a people that we have to start peeling back the onion so that everyone can understand what it's doing so that we then have the power to then change it. So this brings me to another question, which I, it's interesting that because we are so reliant on technology, in many ways, humans, um, we've developed this emotional connection to technology. And so how, you know, what does that mean for us to develop these emotional connections to technology, and particularly in the case of robotic systems? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, it's it's not one of these things that, you know, why am I feeling, you know, this trust? Why am I feeling this aspect of dependency on this technology? Um, so one of the things, remember, the technology is designed from our data. 
right? It knows what we, it knows our interaction. So it's not that, you know, you're, you're being spooked. No, no, no. It's, it's your data. It's all about your data and, and constructing an understanding based on that. Um, and so one of the things um, we think about is, you know, how do you interact with humans, right? Like interact with the AI the same way. And I'll give you an example. You go to a doctor and the doctor tells you and gives you a diagnosis that is, is horrifying, right? What do you do? Right? Do you say, okay, operate on me? Are you like, ah, let me get a second opinion, right? Mm -hmm. Like most of us are like, let me get a second opinion, except when we use AI, if the AI tells us this is a diagnosis, we're like, oh, okay, right? Like, no, 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 let mm -hmm. us get a second opinion. Now, the second opinion could be a human, the second opinion could be another AI system that's developed by another company. Like we need to start thinking about treating these systems the same way we treat other people in a positive way. Because again, they're based on our data, right? They're based on our data. And so we should amplify all the good things about us as we're interacting with these systems. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. I, and again, I think it goes back to our original, you know, our, our initial conversation too about people sort of understanding about their, fully understanding their relationship with the technology. And I think we've, although it's pervasive and it's part of every day, I think we also treat it in some ways like it's peripheral when really it's a very intimate part of our lives. And so we should treat it the same way we would treat our human, in some ways our human interactions, as you say, and stop thinking about it in this very sort of um, transactional kind of way. Right, and I'm gonna give you another example. Just, just you go like, oh, that's interesting. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a coffee drinker, coffee lover, right? And it always seems like I get that nice little deal for Starbucks about the time that I go get my coffee, right? And you know, I have, <laughs> I have, I have habits, like there's yeah. certain days, certain times. Um, and so think about this, like, and so what do I do? Like half the time I'm like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to take advantage. But other times I'm like, no, I, I'm not going to go. And it's just like, you know, that third drink you're not supposed to have. And your friend says, don't, right? Like you should have that little person in the back of your head says like, no, no, no. Don't give them the data. Don't give them the ability <laughs> to basically model you. Uh, but that has to be a choice. And we, again, we do it with people, but do it with our AI system. It's, it's actually no different. And that's our power. That's our power. I think too, the interesting piece too, is the fact that it's become so gamified that from a psychological perspective, we're almost like coaxed into like, how we use it as opposed to treat, yeah. So I think that idea of not giving it the power. <laughs> exactly. It makes sense fundamentally and theoretically, but I think because we've become, we've, we've developed this sort of psychological dependencies on it. I think it makes it very difficult for people to really understand how much control they actually have or could have over it. Yeah, but so the thing is it, it's hard, right? But we, we've been here before. I mean, how many of us, you know, when we were out there would take the stairs? Right, we're like, there's the elevator, it's convenient, it gets me to my meeting, but you know what? This week, I am going to take the stairs. And it's hard because you're sacrificing time and you know, walking up the stairs is sometimes kind of hard on heels, right? But we've done these things before when we know that something is good for us, we make those decisions, right? And it's the same thing with this. It's not gonna be easy. It's not like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna easily disregard, but we have to make a conscious decision to say, oh, What's good for me at this moment in time is, you know, I'm not going to do that. Right, right. So I'm going to I'm going to sh um, shift gears a little bit here and talk a little bit more specifically about your work. So I know you 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 use and and, and are heavily involved in in all aspects of this with the artificial intelligence, robotics, and computer um, vision. So I'm curious too, I, as I again was digging into more of your work, you're you're becoming well known for inclusive robotics, if you will, inclusive and inclusive technology. So could you share what that term means and why it's a particular focus of yours? Yeah, so um, I, I, when we talk about inclusiveness, it means that robots work for everyone. Um, and specifically, one of the research thrusts I have is designing robots for children with special needs, children with disabilities. Um, and uh, first of all, think about children. So children, um, anyone who has children interact with children, they are so diverse, right? Like an eight-year-old is not the same as another eight-year-old as another mm -hmm. eight-year-old, right? Different sizes, different like where they are in terms of school and, and their knowledge and things like that. 
And so designing robots for children already, we're thinking about inclusiveness because they have such a variation. And then add in that children have different abilities, our special needs, and then that even expands. And so when I'm designing AI systems that are personalized and adaptive, it means that it's taking in the person as a whole person that's unique and different. And so it's my responsibility in terms of the AI to adapt to the person, not force the person to adapt to the robotic system. Um, and, and that's really this whole aspect of inclusiveness is that there is no norm. There is no average. That's, that's a falsity. That's a lie. What there is, is that everyone is unique. And so you start with a biased assumption because you have to start somewhere, but knowing that it's a biased assumption and that you are have to adapt so that it is personalized because the norm is a lie. That's interesting. So this idea of personalization is really interesting. So personal this and personalized learning. So there's personalized learning of the human and then there is the personalized learning adaptive system or the, the you know, the um, intelligent machine or robot or whatever it is, right? So just thinking, so this notion of personalization is, um, is one of the 14 National Academy of Engineering Grand Challenges. It's called out, you know, personalized learning. Um, so I'm just curious, how close do you think we are to making this type of person, you know, making personalized learning ubiquitous for all learners and particularly for young learners? Um, so we are, let's put it this way, we are closer. We aren't there yet um, because there's there's really two elements or, or two challenges. Is one is how do you extract the characteristics of that personalization, right? And so if you think about learning, students learn differently, they learn at a different rate, they have priors, like prior knowledge that you may not even know and so how do you extract that in a very easy format? Um, teachers, human teachers are excellent at that, right? Like they can come in, ask a few questions and they know exactly like, oh, this student is here and this student is here. What is it that they're doing? So that's, that's one of the biggest challenge. And then the other is, is how do you scaffold the learning? So you've recognized, you've modeled, you know where they are. How do you then lead them into the learning? Because it might be that this student maybe they're much more better at learning through examples, right? Or maybe they learn better, they're, they're, or, so they just need to hear, so they're auditory, or maybe they have to see something. And so how do you know that? And how do you walk them through and, and provide that personalization? Again, by, you know, I, this, this person comes to me, I'm the robot, you know, what do I do? Um, and that's the technology side. And they're both hard and they're intertwined, right? And, and so, they have these nuanced intertwined aspects that is not just a solve one, solve the other and bring them together. You have to solve them both together. What's been, as you were talking, what's been like the biggest challenge though in that whole research and development process? Um, so I will tell you the biggest challenge, at least in terms of my research is, um, trying to figure out how do you engage people and I mean engineers are people but like engage the users participants in this aspect of personalization so you know I'm designing robots I'm designing them for children with special needs I also do education um, I, I need to bring in the teachers I need to bring in the clinicians I need to bring in the therapists to be the experts but they have a different language than engineers and so how do I bridge that gap? So the hardest problem is the human problem. It's not the technology problem, mm -hmm, honestly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got it, got it. And so then this sort of leads me to wanting to ask you a little bit more about your spin-off, Zyra Robotics. So um, what was, you know, how, 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 what was the impetus for wanting to, to create this, this spin-off? Yeah, so um, I've been doing research with, with my students and, uh, basically working on robotics AI for children with special needs. Um, and I participated in basically a boot camp. So a, a startup boot camp that uh, basically tried to get academics to think entrepreneurial, have an mm -hmm. entrepreneurial mindset. Mm -hmm. And part of that is I had to do customer discovery. So anyone who's in business, customer discovery is actually going out and talking to potential customers about your product that doesn't exist, like your vaporware product. And so I had to learn that. And one of the things I found when I was talking to people is everyone that I ran into said, when can I get this and when can I buy it? 
And I was mm. like, oh, it doesn't exist. Like th there must be, a new I just thought it was me. Like I love my research and like the kids that I was working with, but there seemed to be such a need. Mm. And so that was it. It was like, I, I need to fulfill this need because I have the technology, I have the research and we need to figure out how to make it into a product so it can be accessible to anyone who wants it. And then in terms of its evolution, how, you know, is it remark, remark, remarkably different from where it began to, yeah. It is. Um, so it started off, we had uh, hardware. So we had physical robotic systems um, and we had a little bit of software. Now we, we still have the robotics, but the majority of our, I guess, products is the software. So our software, our apps, you know, on, on iTunes, um, they are adaptive, they are sort of personalized. Uh, and so they engage students, even though they are uh, learning. And I always say like with our so one of our applications, we can get a four-year-old to code, right? Like to code and we get not just a four-year-old, like a four-year-old, whatever their ability or disability, we can get them and teach them how to code using our software, right? Like, so it switched from a pure, you know, hardware robotics to much more of an artificial intelligence software company. And like uh, computational thinking and... Computational thinking, uh, repeated learning, um, understanding, even things as simple as, you know, what should I have a student pay attention to in the screen, which is gonna be different depending on where you are in your learning phase. Right, right. And then, so I'm just curious too, um, um, has the current pandemic influenced your work in any way? Have any new research questions emerged? Yes, uh, the biggest one is how do you um, ensure access during a, a remote learning experience? Uh, one of the things that we saw uh, very early on was that uh, there was a lot of disparities um, in communities, especially in the US. Right, like the technology, even the technology my company was designing, the technology that I was, there was an assumption that there was an expert, which typically was a, a teacher or a clinician or a therapist. Um, we very rarely, you know, the parent was there, but they were there with the child. We, we you know, they were there in terms of engagement, but not necessarily the subject expert. And that's changed. And mm. so now you have kids where their parents have to be the subject expert or they themselves have to be the subject expert. It's totally shifting what it is to do learning and teaching. And, and so we've had to think about this and we're steadily trying to figure out how to do this. Of, of how do you make the system even more, much, much more like a tutor that is your subject expert in itself in the AI system? One of the things that we've uncovered in our conversations with educators and with some of our, our, our colleagues um, in the education space and particularly focusing on vulnerable populations is their suspicion of the technology. And so we heard a number of cases where parents and, and caregivers are um, not so keen on this idea of virtual learning, not knowing who's on the other side, who's watching their kids, um, access to data, things of, the, of, of that nature. And so I'm wondering, you know, to what extent have you experienced that, you know, comparing sort of, you know, um, under-resourced communities versus other communities and how they engage with and their acceptance of using technology, these, these kinds of technologies? Yeah, so, um, and, and it, I wouldn't say it's technology in general. Right. Um, what I would say, it's the virtual technology because right. it's, uh, they're spying on me, they're surveilling me, they're going to see something that I don't want them to see. Uh, they're tracking my kids, right? It's, it's all of that, but technology where you're not necessarily connected. And so we've seen an increase, for example, in, in games. Why is that? Games are technologies, but it, it doesn't feel as invasive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you think about, uh, there's been an increase even in vulnerable populations in terms of the streaming services and movies and things like that. That's, that, in fact, that's also collecting your data, like at the, at probably even more so. But yet it, you don't have the same feeling because it doesn't feel like it's spying on you. Right. Um, and so it's really this aspect of technology is not about technology. It's this distrust if you think that the technology is releasing personal information within your home. 
And so gamification, I think, is one of the, the elements and key elements of, of bringing that into the home, even mm -hmm. for more vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. All right, so we are getting close to time, but I, I cannot leave you without a conversation about your latest, your latest. Yes. So the title is a very compelling title. Could you sort of, you know, explain how this came about and, and what are some of the takeaways? Yeah, so uh, Sex, Race and Robots, How to Be Human in the Age of AI. Um, and so most people don't really, so Sex, Race and Robots is like, oh, that's sexy. Um, and I've had some people like, sex? Like, I'm like, no, 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 no. So just so you, so sex is actually not only about sexism, but also this aspect of how we're sexualizing our series and our Alexa uh, in terms of gendering uh, our technology. Uh, and so it actually encompasses both gender, gender identity, and this aspect of, of sexism. Uh, race, uh, I talk about things like, you know, can a robot be racist, right? Like how can a robot be racist? And, and what does that actually mean in terms of our own historical biases and, and what we can do? I believe that robots shouldn't have a race or, or sex, right? And why is that? I mean, if, if you listen to it, you will fully understand why this is. Um, and, and really it was designed because I wanted to give people understanding of what it is when we talk about AI and robotics. So that is digestible, it's not this vaporware and things like that. And so talk about the positives of, of the good, but also, you know, give some words of, of empowerment of things that you can do personally to, to make sure that you're not uh, susceptible to being deceived and, and confirmation bias and, and things like that, because, you know, that cat video keeps showing up and you don't know why, right? Like, you, you wanna know why, right? <laughs> you will learn why, and also the ways of making sure it doesn't come up again. Right, right, very interesting. Is there a reason why you chose the audio audible format as opposed to, uh, is it available in hard copy? Uh, not yet. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the audio format and, and even the, the narrator, uh, there's a reason as well. Uh, so the audio format was really to push the accessibility, right? Sure. I, I wanted to make sure that it was accessible to basically all audiences sure. is the reason for that. Um, and, and like, for example, I'm not a big reader, I'm a skipper, right? But you give me an article and it will take me five minutes and I can tell you exactly what it is, but I didn't read every word. So I like the audio format as well. It's the way I, I learn. And then with, with uh, Amanla, um, for, for those of you who don't know her, uh, she was Rue in The Hunger Games. So that's the science fiction, science fantasy love I have. Oh, see, and I think her, her I don't know if, uh, there we go. Yes, yeah, right. and then the uh, so she was Rue. So that's the science fiction, science fantasy, uh -huh. like the love I have. And then uh, she was the main character in The Hate You Give, which is about social injustice. Yes, and yes. How do you fight for yourself and fight for your community? And that's really what this is about. It's about the, the AI and the robotics and the science, but then also about this aspects of what we can do to be empowered in order to ensure that we have the best of AI without being subjective to, to the worst and, and mitigating the bias. What a brilliant collaboration. I think that's fantastic. I can't wait to listen to it. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions that came in from the audience. Um, this one um, is sort of back to what we were talking about initially around um, invention and, and innovation. So the question from the audience is, Dr. Howard, what is your favorite invention? Um, my favorite invention. So. I'm going to kind of rephrase that. My favorite invention is actually the pet rock. And I'm going to explain that. So it's not because it's a pet rock, but it just shows you the power of marketing, the power of ensuring that people understand your message when you're inventing something, right? And, and if you think about the pet rock, like the rock, it's been like here forever, like before people. And yet it was invented, right? Like as a product and, and made a lot of money. And it's because Someone said, this is the value of this rock. This is how it enhances your life. This is what it can do for you, right? And that messaging is, is really why I say that it's my favorite one because it has such a beautiful story about you know inventing something, but really about figuring out the usage and what do people value and need is really the, 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 the lesson behind that. That's absolutely That's fascinating, very fascinating. And then the last question is, um, is it really possible for machines to take over the world? 
Um, so uh, I will say not in my lifetime. And if I'm wrong, I probably won't care. Uh, and so, um, and, and why is it? So one of the things that uh, I always emphasize is that the machines are learning from people. And, and which it also means that even though it's inheriting our biases, it also inherits things like our empathy and our humanity. It, it starts to understand that. And I think about the relationship a parent has with a child, right? Like a parent clearly is quote unquote superior than a child, right? They have more knowledge, they have more experience, they have more money, and yet they don't annihilate their child, right? Like they just don't do it. it it's something they just don't do because you have this deep connection and, and so the way we're designing AI, it has that deep connection because it's, it's based on us. It's based on our human fallibilities, but also our human emotions. Um, and so I think that's why it, it may have the power to, but I don't believe that it ever would because of that. Very good. Well, Dr. Howard, it's been a pleasure. You're brilliant. Thank you for spending time with us today. Uh, and I look forward to uh, future conversations with you. I also do believe that we have a few uh, colleagues in common. Uh, Chris Rogers at Tufts University. Yes. Used to work with when I was uh, at Tufts. Um, Andrew Williams, who's at, um, yeah. And yes, yes. Juan Gilbert, the list, of, oh, oh, the, list oh, the list goes on. Three of my favorite people, among <laughs> others. The list goes on. So I'm really, again, I got an all-star for, for my first uh, episode. So this has been a great conversation. Thank you for hosting. Abs thank you, thank you. So that, that's all we have for you all today. Thank you for joining us on this first episode of Engineering for Good. And um, hopefully you uh, enjoyed it you found it fun, you found it insightful. And uh, I will see you again um, for the next episode in November. Take care, thank you. <laughs>